Welcome back to Cordell and Cordell's town hall series regarding COVID-19 and its impact on guys before, during, and after divorce. I'm Scott Trout, CEO and managing partner of Cordell and Cordell. And today we wanted to bring to you some celebrity stories about divorce and post-divorce and what guys can learn by their mistakes. You know, as we talk about celebrities, it's a little salacious in the divorce aspect and, and actually post-divorce. But what we want to know is really what we can learn from them. Because for the most part, all of those cases are the same with the exception of the complication of more property, more money, just more assets in general that really complicate divorce issues. So you can learn from them and that's why we want to talk about them today. Make sure to stay tuned for the live, uh, the question and answer session where we're going to go through a lightning round. So make sure if you want to ask your questions live of our panelists, you can submit that now in our Q&A section. Make sure you give your first name and the city or state that you're in, not your last name, and just say, yeah, I'd like to ask that live and we'll have our panel ask it. If you'd rather not, just have a question. You want us to read it, have our panel answer it. You could submit that via chat. So stick around for that. That's going to be a lot of fun and you'll get a lot of your questions answered for you. Otherwise, you can tune into my daily podcast where we talk a lot about those spot issues that affect guys during uh, and after divorce as a result of COVID-19. If you want a virtual consult or telephonic consult, remember we're available at 866-DADS-LAW or you can find us online at cordellcordell.com. You can also submit your questions to coronavirus.divorce at cordelllaw.com and I'll address those in my daily podcast as you can find us on that YouTube channel. So let's go ahead and introduce our panel today. But before I do that, I want to make sure you understand that this is not an attorney-client relationship. We don't want to give you legal advice. Each one of your cases, each one of your facts are different. Our advice as we go through it may be different. It may be different than today because everything that you have and the facts that you have in your case matter specifically. So we encourage you to seek out an attorney's advice. We encourage you to make that phone call and get more detailed questions answered. This really is just for talking points for you to encourage you to go get a consultation with an attorney. And again, we're available if you need to do that and you can find us online at cordellcordell.com. So let's, before we get started in uh, the topic today as we talk about celebrity divorce, let's go ahead and introduce our panel of six Cordell and Cordell attorneys. Joining us first is Ron Gore from Oklahoma. Welcome, Ron. Hi, Scott. My name is Ron Gore. I am a senior lead litigator based out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have two offices in Oklahoma, one in Tulsa, one in Oklahoma City. I've been an attorney practicing for 13 years, exclusively family law for the past six. Thanks for having me, Scott. Thanks, Ron. Also joining us in Hartford, Connecticut, is a senior litigation attorney, Alex Ritter. Welcome, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, as Scott said, part of our Hartford office. Uh, we cover the whole state of Connecticut. Uh, I have been practicing law for five years, uh, exclusively in the area of family law, and I've been with Cordell for the past year. Thanks for having me, Scott. Thanks. Diana Magala, up in New Jersey and also licensed in New York, is joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana Magala, and I have been practicing family law for nine years and with the firm for six years now. We have offices throughout New Jersey, servicing all of New Jersey, Mount Laurel, East Brunswick, and Saddlebrook, New Jersey. And our Saddlebrook office services the five boroughs of New York and Long Island. Thanks, Diana. In the middle of the United States in Kansas City, Missouri, Igor Vangeli, welcome. Thank you, Scott. Uh, my name is Igor Vangeli. I've been practicing for, uh, this is my third year of practice in family law exclusively. I practice out of our Kansas City office. I do practice both in Kansas and in Missouri since I'm licensed in both states. Thanks. Going down south to Texas in Austin, Colleen Kinsler, a lead litigator. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Scott. So I am a lead litigator in the Austin, Texas office. I have been doing family law for 10 years, over 10 years at this point. I am licensed in Illinois and Texas, but do practice primarily in Texas and specifically in the Austin area. Thanks for having me today, Scott. Thanks, Colleen. And, and rounding out our panel of Cordell and Cordell attorneys is Michael Turner in Greenville, South Carolina. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Scott. My name is Michael Turner, and I'm a lead litigator in our Greenville, South Carolina office. Uh, we also have offices in Charleston and Columbia, South Carolina. I've been practicing law for 14 years, but I've been practicing exclusively family law for the last 10 years, and I've been with Cordell and Cordell for almost five years now. Thanks for having me today. 
Thanks, Michael. And before we get started, we know with our topic of the day, remember, if you want your questions answered live by our panel, you can ask that question by submitting that question in our Q&A section. Also, if you just want it read, you can submit that in our chat box. Make sure to list your first name and just your state. We want to keep your uh, privacy as important and privacy. Uh, make sure it's just first name and state so we can address that to you. So let's talk about the first uh, celebrity divorce, which really is making the headlines now across all news channels, and that's Kristen Cavallari and Jay Cutler. You know, there are a lot on social media. They're using their agents to, to kind of go after one another. It really is a really good example of how guys can learn from some mistakes here. And I want to really first turn to Ron Gore in, in Oklahoma. Ron, uh, we'll talk about social media because that really, no matter if you're a celebrity or you're a guy watching right now, you know, social media is so prevalent and guys use it and their spouses use it. And I want to talk a little bit about it. But before we get that, Ron, why don't you tell everyone that's watching and listening right now, what's the status of the Oklahoma courts? Well, we're under a, a statewide order from the Supreme Court of Oklahoma that says the courts are closed through May 15th. They're going to resume that following Monday. But we have 77 counties in Oklahoma. Each of those counties is under an individual order from its district court. So the processes will be a little bit different in each of the counties. But currently, the courts are accepting pleadings. Uh, you can go ahead and start proceedings. They're hearing emergency motions and things like that. But it'll get a little bit closer to normal starting uh, May 18th. Thanks, Ron. So, you know, social media, if you look at this article, and it was on page six.com, and, and of course, a, num a number of other media outlets have picked up this story. In particular, they're going after each other. The agents are going after each other on social media. Cavallari is also kind of a social media queen. Uh, they're using this method, this avenue, to kind of put out their strategy to go after one another, particularly about parenting time, custody time, and really the purchase of a house, which we'll talk about whether or not that's a good idea during a divorce or even afterwards, and what do you do with it? But is social media used? Do you recommend that for guys in general, whether they're considering a divorce or even a modification? Certainly not. Uh, there's really no upside to using social media during that time, and there's a whole lot of downside. Uh, the courts already know that even if you come across well in your social media posts, you're on stage and you're probably acting at your best, hopefully. Uh, we also are all human, and so we all have times, especially during difficult times like a divorce, where we're not acting as well as we would like to act towards each other. And so if you're acting well, the court may think, oh, it's just an act. If you're acting poorly, the court may think, man, they can't even control their behavior when they know that everybody's seeing it. What are they doing behind closed doors? So since there's no upside and there's lots of downside, it's not a good idea yeah. to do. And, and in fact, it, it's also important to remember that, you know, it's forever. You may think that you're deleting it, but you can't do during a litigation anyway, but it may be preserved and your children may see it. They may hear about it. So not only is it unwise strategically, it's really not in the best interest of the kids to mm -hmm. air that kind of laundry online. Not only your kids or your friends, your family, but the judge may see it as evidence, which is right. even worse. I mean, you think about it, I was on Dr. Phil and we talked about using social media and it, I mean, it's just a general no-no because there's just so much negative. I don't ever really see a positive where I've used it to advance my client's case. I've used it really to go after the opposing party uh, in terms of what they're posting, what their friends are saying. And we look at that and you look at Cavallari and you look at Cutler and they're trying to use it. And obviously, because they're in the public eye, they're trying to use this social media attack to try to hurt them and get them to the table to negotiate. But I just don't see that. Don't you think it's better to just simply, look, if you've got an issue, communicate with your spouse, you know, in writing and on the phone so you can kind of record in writing what was, was said. And if you've got, you know, something you want, don't you recommend just sending an email, picking up the phone? Of course. And also part of the concern with social media is that once you put the post out there, even if you crafted it how you wanted to and, and strategically the best way, if there were such a way to do so during a divorce, you're not going to be able to control as well the comments and how the comment threads go. And all of those comments associated to people you don't even know could be attributed to you in terms of putting out this overall message. So certainly that would be a way better way to go. It seems like you know they have this show where they have their lives online mm -hmm. and it, there's a lot of benefit to them of having the ne negativity aired as part of a plot line but this is real life not the show and so mm -hmm. i think they need to get back to better communication it would seem 
Yeah, I mean, the same mistakes that celebrities make are the very same mistakes that guys that are watching right now make. And that's why I think it's so relevant to look at what's in the public eye, learn from what they're doing, and don't make those same mistakes. In fact, not getting on social media is one of the big mistakes that guys make when facing divorce or even modification. You know, Alex, one of the issues with Cavallari and Cutler was she wanted to purchase a home, moved out. She wants to use marital funds to, to buy a home. And it appears that from what we learn is that Cutler may be stopping that, prohibiting that, and trying to use as leverage to get an interim custody plan or maybe some sort of settlement. So I want to hear your opinion on that. But first, just like Ron, what's going on up in Connecticut and what are the what's the status of the court system there? Well, so here in Connecticut, we're still currently on a stay-at-home order. Um, the legal services are considered essential, but what they've done is they've physically closed many of the courthouses in Connecticut and consolidated them into one courthouse open in every jurisdiction. Um, and all they're hearing are priority one cases, which are you know emergency custody actions or restraining orders. That said, we are still able to electronically file, you know, new divorces or motions with the caveat that we may not be getting hearing dates for, you know, another couple of months. Uh, we are very close to the epicenter and considered even part of it. So they're being very cautious on, on reopening. Um, we did just hear from Judicial just a couple of hours ago, actually, that they are going to start conducting some status conferences and possibly some family pretrials telephonically. Um, I'm sure more logistical details will be coming out on that uh, within the day. It seems like it's changing daily. Yeah, it is. It, it, almost hourly, if you go across the country, yeah. you hear something different with new guidelines. So we talk about this issue that is really on the front lines with Cavallari in the purchase of a house, and I think what's complicating this, and the guys can learn from this, is that we're you know involved kids here. Mm -hmm. And that to me seems, it, it makes it a little bit more of a complicated discussion and consideration for guys that are watching this and whether or not they should consent to something. But in generally speaking, you know, is this something that, you know, I say you need to consider the kids when thinking about whether to consent or deny the purchase of a home? I don't know what her living situation is. I don't know where she is. And I imagine judges will have an opinion if you're kind of getting in the way when we're talking about the best interests of kids, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, I know, example for here, here in Connecticut, if you are starting to discuss assets and purchasing of homes, et cetera, compared to parenting plans and how that's going to look, you know, the courts don't look favorably on that because the most important thing is really what's in the best interests of these kids um, and, and what's the parenting plan going to look like. And generally, you don't actually get to talk about you know, asset division, at least here in Connecticut, until you've really resolved the parenting issues. Um, and, and again, as, as I said, the courts don't look favorable on withholding certain things for financial reasons or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally speaking, I, I don't know that purchasing a new home during the pendency of a divorce is the best way to go. But then again, you know, you never know because every case and every situation is mm -hmm. different. You know, there may be facts and circumstances in, in a particular case that may make that, you know, a good choice. Um, you know, certainly there are ways to handle that um, if that is a possibility and, and there are assets enough, I mean, to go around. Obviously, in this case, you know, we have a celebrity couple. They probably have the means to do something like this, um, and it can be accounted for, you know, if things aren't hotly disputed. You know, whether they have money or you're right, I mean, it does make things easier from the ability to afford it, and it creates perhaps another asset. But you know, for guys watching, one of the things they, that they should be concerned about, and if you use this as a great example, Alex, would be maybe avoid thrift spending, you know, without consent. Don't, don't go buying a new car or going on a vacation. Don't you think that judges look at that negatively if you're doing it without, the, you know, the consent and uh, understanding of your spouse? Uh, without a doubt. I actually have a case here in Connecticut where one of my clients, um, he, his wife purchased a, um, a new home without consent using, you know, funds that were subject to an asset division in the divorce. So, you know, we had to deal with that. And ultimately, you know, it comes out in, in the settlement distribution, or if we go to trial, it's an issue that that will be dealt with there. So no, they don't look favorably on that. Um, in that type of situation, sometimes it's a violation of, of any sort of automatic orders that states have that say, you know, you can't spend this type of money during a divorce. Right. So, Ron, just coming back to you, I want to turn the tables a little bit because, you know, there are guys right now that they're in the opposite situation. They're not in, you know, the Cavalry. They're the, they're basically, they are the Cavalry where they're maybe, they left the house, you know, mom or their spouse is still in the house, the marital home, and they're looking for a place. 
and, and they need somewhere to go, really. And the question really becomes, what should guys be doing? Should they be reaching out and trying to reach an agreement first with their spouse, trying to secure an asset? You know, is that something that you encourage them to do? Sure. I always encourage them to communicate proactively before they make any sort of decision. Uh, it gives everyone a chance to be reasonable and gives a, the court a chance to see who's not going to be reasonable. Certainly one of the biggest things that I'm concerned about in having a parent move out of a home is issues of custody and visitation and establishing a perceptive, a perception that there's a baseline that maybe the other parent who remains in the home is and should be the custodial parent when maybe it really is just a circumstance that to deflate the tensions and to make it better for everyone, including the kids, someone needs to move out and the more reasonable person does it. I mean, in this Cavallari case, one of the concerns that I would have if this were in Oklahoma is that I think from her prior history on TV, you know, we know she's from California. So it may create a relocation issue if you have one parent becoming the primary custodial parent and then filing a motion to relocate and take the kids cross country. So there are lots of issues that are wrapped up with moving out of the marital home that in the long term far exceed uh, that immediate property distribution. Yeah, and you know, bring up the good point about moving from you know their home state to perhaps California. We move on to kind of the Gwen Stefani and Gavin Rossdale case. I'm gonna to talk to Diana and Eagers because that's so huge when we talk about a relocation, especially right now during COVID-19 where there are guys watching, they're thinking, you know, I either live in separate states and I'm not getting the court order visitation or my wife has picked up and left. And I don't know where she is or I'm in the middle of a divorce and she wants to move back home where her other family is. And so in this case, particularly, you know, you have Stefani who's moved to Oklahoma during COVID-19 for whatever reason she thinks it's a safer location. She can live on bigger acreage. But what's happening is her ex, Gavin Rossdale, is not getting the kind of custody he really, really wanted and is really ordered and there are guys right now that are watching the exact same situation, whether they live in the same city, they live in the same state, or they live in different states because of COVID-19. And so this is a really great example uh, of that issue. And Diana, I'm going to turn to you. And like I did with the other panelists, is really first and foremost, what's going on in New Jersey and New York since you're licensed there in both and serve all that area? So as you know, New York and New Jersey, obviously we are at the epicenter where the two worst states with the most cases of Corona. But luckily in New Jersey, we actually were not open yet, but we are open for emergent matters. And the courts for the first time have started e-filing. We didn't have e-filing in New Jersey and a lot of people don't know about it, but e-filing has just started in response to the pandemic. And it actually has been very successful. You can still overnight things or mail things to the court, but you can also e-file. We can start new divorces, we can set motions, and we can file anything via e-courts or overnight mails. And the courts have been very responsive in either filing Zoom calls, so we're allowed to have Zoom mediations and Zoom motions, or telephone conferences. And that goes for basically anything now. In New York, it's a little bit different. It depends on where in New York, but again, they're still closed, so it's only emergent matters only. And in most places in New York, it's only if your matter has been pending, but they're not taking any new cases just yet. Yeah. You know, so this, what's, Rossdale is kind of doing the same thing and kind of taking this to the media and making this a public spectacle that we really can learn from because guys are listening and they're watching. So they're sitting there saying, I'm not seeing my kids. Uh, perhaps uh, Stefani's using COVID-19 as an example to not transport them back and forth from Oklahoma, even the court order to do so. And the guys are asking right now, Diana, when is it really uh, legal for someone to deny their spouse under a court order, their ex-spouse, you know, court-ordered custody? When is it appropriate? And uh, really, what can they do uh, to enforce their rights? It's not legal to deny any custody in parenting time. As long as there is a court order, that court order is in place until there is a new court order or a written agreement. So at this point, she can't and she shouldn't be denying them any custody or parenting time. What I would suggest for any clients that are going through the same thing is to immediately file a motion with the court. I actually have a case right now, and it's two different states. It's Pennsylvania and New Jersey, where mom in New Jersey has denied parenting time to dad, stating that Pennsylvania is seeing an increase in cases. Again, unless there's a reason or the dad has 
the virus or there's people in the house that have the virus, there is no reason to deny that parenting time. And what I've seen courts be very, very strict with that saying, unless there's an actual reason, unless it's in the best interest of the children not to see the parents, this is not the time to be taking away parenting time. In fact, I've had a judge say that, especially in New Jersey, one of the only stay-at-home executive orders is that you can go see immediate family members, and they are considering children to be immediate family members. You know, we've talked about it for the last couple of weeks where we've had two separate cases in Florida, kind of along the same issue, but both doctors where even the courts have said, look, just the increased exposure or risk of exposure is still not enough to deny custody or contact or visitation with your kids. So I, I agree with you. I think it's got to be some sort of positive COVID-19 test or being sick or traveling. Otherwise, you should be communicating and putting kind of your position in writing to your spouse, right? Don't you think they should be saying, look, I was due custody last weekend. I'm available next weekend. Just documenting. Isn't that critical in order to build your case? Absolutely. I've advised a specific client to basically make a calendar and state all the times that he's missed so that when we do file the motion and the reply, we have that to the court. But every week, confirm to mom, these are the days I was supposed to have the child and I've missed it just in case she decides to deny it later. It's in written form. Yeah. Eagers, I want to come to you and, and really find out again, just like everything else, I want to find out what's going on in Missouri particularly up in Kansas City and the Kansas area on the court system. And then I want to ask you a little bit about what guys can do to take action. So, Eagers, what's going on in the court system right now? Well, I, I think compared with the rest of the country, we've been fortunate enough that our courts have been operating, uh, especially on the Missouri side in Kansas City, I would say fully operating virtually, whether it has been WebEx or Zoom. I had this particular case last week. Uh, which was set for a full-blown trial on May 1st, and the judge intended to go on WebEx on the full-blown trial. Um, Fortunately, it was uh, settled uh, the day before, and we didn't have to do that. But the cases are ongoing. Same thing in the Kansas side, with the exception that the judges are not doing trials over camera. They're doing everything else, whether that's a motion for temporary orders hearing, whether that's a pretrial conference, or just a status hearing. Uh, So we've been lucky enough to get our cases moving and the advice that we've been giving our clients is that you don't wait, uh, especially in this area here, to, uh, to file a case because you can file a case now electronically, you can file a case in person uh, as well, although there is some exceptions there depending on the, on the jurisdiction of the state that you are in. Um, but yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, I was gonna no. say that you know, one of the things is, the five, one of the five mistakes we talked about is inaction and doing nothing. And as you point out, get something on file. If you've been denied custody, you know, a family access motion or the like, something that's already, you know, in your state or your city. But one of the things I think that occurs, particularly in this case, in Stefani case, really is perhaps what we call parental alienation. And many are not familiar with that. What should they be looking for? And what is parental alienation, particularly when you're not seeing your kids routinely? Well, there is certain things that the guy should be looking uh, for. First thing you have to, to look for a decrease in desire of the child to talk to their dad, right? Uh, or their refusal to talk to their dad. Or you hear from the child that, hey, mom or a third party, like a grandparent um, or a significant other of mom purchased me some expensive gifts, right? Or mom getting a five or six year old on the phone telling that I don't want to come to your house. You know, those are some of the factors that, that the guy should be looking as a potential uh, parental alienation taking place at this time. Um, as far as what they need to do, well, the first thing is you address it with your, with your co-parent. And by addressing it, first you do it in writing, so you keep a paper trail and a record. And second, you don't start with accusations, right? You start in a civil manner, you, you address it in a very professional manner. And if that's not going anywhere or the other party is not being responsive, then you file something with the court. In Kansas side, for example, we would be filing a motion for emergency relief if that, you know, uh, what you think is parental alienation is also affecting your parenting time with the child, that you're not seeing your child, that you're not communicating with the child over the phone as previously ordered by the court. And on that emergency relief motion, uh, you'd be asking the court to pretty much order the other parent to comply with the court orders. And the court typically would be very receptive of that and, and schedule a virtual hearing pretty fast. On, on the Missouri side, we would file what's called a uh, motion for family access if you're being denied uh, either physical time with your children or uh, telephonic or virtual time. 
And typically those hearings are scheduled, you know, within 30 to 45 days from the date of filing. But what's most important, irrespective of when the date of the hearing is scheduled by the court, which is not in your control, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you have to file something. You don't have to wait. And it's important to put the court on notice that, hey, judge, this is what's going on. And I couldn't come in front of you because of this pandemic. I've been prohibited of having my time in time as ordered by the court. So um, I agree. I mean, the, the point is, is to file something. And Diana, if, if you're Rossdale's attorney, I mean, what are you telling him to do right now? He hasn't seen his kids probably in six or seven weeks. Uh, we don't really know if he's communicated with them. Uh, that's just not, you know, we don't have a lot of the facts. But what would you be saying to, to Rossdale right now? I mean, of course, communication with the children is very important, and the courts will question why he hasn't done that if he hasn't, but he should be FaceTiming them every day. And even if they don't answer, at least there's a lock that he has been trying to do that. Again, emailing mom and sending her text messages and calling her as well and letting her know that he's trying to communicate. But again, the number one thing anybody should be doing right now, especially with all the courts being open to e-filing, is filing a motion with the court because it will be enforced more if it comes from a judge. But there's no reason to wait on filing that motion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Eagers, just to kind of round out this part before we go to commercial break, is, is there a method in which or is there relief by a court to get guys you know, the time that they've lost, like let's just take Rossdale, seven weeks, let's just say it's supposed to be every other weekend, or it could be 50-50. Is there, in Missouri at least, is there a way for a judge to say, I'm going to give you makeup time, you know, through some sort of motion, or is that time lost forever? Absolutely. Uh, uh, there is, uh, Scott, and I had uh, a case myself not too long ago, which we had a similar situation where we had to file a motion for family access because mom had both denied a holiday to father, as well as, you know, uh, every other weekend and a few days during the week uh, for that time period. So we filed a family access motion, got in front of the judge. The judge agreed with our case and ruled in favor of our client. So what the judge did is that the next holiday, although per the previous court order would have been the holiday of mom, then dad's going to have that holiday. And for those, uh, I believe it was about seven or eight days that dad had lost, the judge spread those in the next month or month and a half, I believe, for dad to have an extra day every week or extra uh, two days every week, depending on, on the week and the parenting schedule. Yeah, well, that's good news because, you know, guys really want to make it up. Uh, I'm sorry, Di Diana, were you saying something? Yes, and Scott, I was going to say, at least here in New Jersey, we've closed schools for the rest of the school year, so now is the time to do it. If it's seven weeks or more than a couple of weeks, now is the time to yeah. file that motion and say, hey, court, the, the kids are close or the summer you know can be mine and it's good time for parents because when do we really get three or four or five weeks not being able to go to work so this is the perfect time to tell the court i'll take that time now while we're all at home yeah it is i mean it's more incentive to do something right now rather than wait when all this break time you know just goes by and many guys think well i'll just wait till the court system back opens back up but i just don't think it's a good idea so I want to remind everyone we're getting close to getting to the second half where we want to answer your questions live. And if you have one and you want to ask it live of our panel, submit it via Q&A. If you just want your question read, you can submit that via chat and we'll get that to you. But before we get on to the next topic, we're going to take a really, very really quick commercial break and we'll be right back. Even in the toughest of times, there are usually opportunities for relief. Many husbands and dads listening now are struggling to stay current on alimony and child support orders. You should know that this crisis may allow you to modify your support obligations, but time is of the essence. If you're a guy needing help right now, not someday when things are back to normal, call us at Cordell & Cordell. This is what we do. So welcome back. So we want to talk about uh, Jim Edmonds and Megan King. That is another one that's one of the more pressing divorce uh, celebrity, Jim Edmonds being a former baseball player. And he's in the news uh, talking about a lot, again, simple issues about custody. And again, COVID-19 impacting a lot of guys out there where Megan has gone off to California, allegedly. And, and the question becomes, was that with consent? And what does he do with getting his makeup time? He's not seeing his kids. And so that's really important when we talk about this. And guys are wanting to know. We want another example of that. And again, using social media again. You know, I think another mistake that, that, that people are making when we talk about social media. So let's go down to Colleen in Texas. Colleen, as we start off every topic, can you tell us what's going on in the court system in Texas real fast? 
Absolutely. So uh, Texas, as you know, is an incredibly large state. So we do have a blanket order that says that there are no in-person hearings or trials until June 1st. That being said, the courts are still hearing emergency matters such as domestic violence cases um, and other cases that they deem an emergency. On top of that, in Texas, we do do e-filing, so you can start a new case. The judges have been working, um, almost every county is working with the attorneys to get orders entered. So if you can submit an agreed order, if you can submit an um, uncontested divorce with an affidavit, the courts will approve that divorce so you can resolve your case. Uh, additionally, for time sensitive or some emergency matters, they are using electronic means like Zoom or other uh, teams. It, it seems that every court is kind of working a little bit differently. So if you are in Texas and wanting to move forward, talk to an attorney in your area. We have offices all over Texas, and they will be able to advise you of, of what's going on in your area. That's good to know. Because that is really the most important thing is to kind of understand the court system as I did a podcast uh, about a week ago and trying to really navigate the system and find out what you can do. That's really the most important thing because you, we're telling you to take action, but we use the word closed or the building is closed. And so it's just really confusing and encourage you to, to find the resources out there, find the guidelines that suggest what you can and get a hold of an attorney as we've talked about earlier. And you can talk to us at cordellcordell.com or 866-DADS-LAW. But Colleen, really the question with the Jim Edmonds case, and albeit it involves custody, but it also involves child support. And, and one of the allegations or one of the things you see on social media is his wife is talking about how uh, she doesn't have enough child support. And then, you know, you got Jim Edmonds' agent going on saying, well, if she doesn't have enough child support, she must be buying eggs, eggs at Fabergé or something crazy. You know, it just, they just continue to do this. So the question really becomes, really, when guys are thinking about child support, the takeaway for, for normal guys here is what do they pay? And, and how do they arrive at an amount and, and know it's enough money from a judge's perspective if they're getting ready to go through a divorce? Absolutely. Uh, so, and there, there used to be, I think, uh, a magazine that the stars are just like us. And, and this is so true, especially in this case, is you have people posting on social media of just the soundbite of, oh, I can't afford to pay my kids this or I'm not getting anything. And then if you look deeper into that situation, it, she makes that statement, but then come to find out in addition to paying child support, he's paying for mortgage, for all bills, for all the kids' expenses, he's paying that all directly. So three separate households he's paying for. And that soundbite isn't being posted on social media. And I think that that's a very important part whenever you're sitting here walking into a modification or at the beginning of a case, trying to show a judge what's truly going on and not just having those blanket claims, sound bites. It's creating a detailed budget, creating a detailed with supporting documents of here's all that I am paying mm -hmm. and the numbers are what the numbers are, you know? Um, and, and so I think going into court and being able to show a judge here's where the money's going and have it be reasonable is going to be significantly more powerful than just, well, I, I need money, you know? It is. I and mean, I think that it is paying something, especially now, I think what becomes more uh, relevant when we talk about child support. And, and unfortunately, when you look at the celebrities, they don't have this issue in terms of facing 33 million unemployed now with our new numbers that came out today. And, you know, you've got guys watching right now you figure there's eight to 10 million guys uh, that are in the middle of a divorce, considering a divorce, maybe post-divorce, they need to modify. The question is, uh, is there an ability for guys to go right now, go file something to try to give themselves some relief? And is it important to file now or should they just wait if they can't afford their child support? Absolutely. So I, I, that's something, again, and, and you heard me before, talk to your attorney, because it can differ by state. Every state has its own laws. In Texas, from the time of filing, the court will consider the date of filing as, as going retroactive and decreasing support from that date. Also, very important to say, keep paying something, you know, if, if you're receiving unemployment, if you did get a stimulus check, pay something, and then you can go into court and tell the judge, here's the situation, here's what I was able to pay based on my, my rent, 
food for other people in my household. And so, yes, absolutely go file now. Talk to an attorney to figure out if you file now what, what can be done. You know, the last thing with really the Edmonds case and that what we, the takeaways for guys looking at this, I mean, I think it's real easy to just look at these types of news articles as almost entertainment, but I think one of the reasons we're covering it is that you can learn from these, and there's something you can pull out of this. And guys, one thing I think is the communication between Edmonds and his wife. Here we have wife just picking up and leaving and going to California, and apparently he had no idea. And it doesn't appear he's done anything in terms of trying to figure out why, how, how long, or what. And so I guess the question, the takeaway, are you suggesting guys really engage in a different level, not social media, we've already talked about that, a different level of trying to take action now, kind of put themselves and put her on notice that he's objecting to her, you know, continuing to travel, don't you think? Absolutely. Especially during this time period, there is a risk. Uh, uh, there's just a safety risk, you know. Um, one of the things to consider with the travel restrictions is if you end up having an order, sometimes we include travel restrictions in the order, and you want to be careful because you don't want it to be too strict that it's impeding on your right to privacy when, when you have the children. But at the same time, during this time period, it, it just doesn't seem like that was the smartest decision on her part. Um, and, and some states in Texas, we have standing orders that specifically say you cannot remove the child from the state of Texas while a case is pending. So look into where you're living if there's a case pending. Are there standing orders? Are there orders in place that are prohibiting that? And do you have an enforcement action? Does that lead to questioning her judgment as to what's in the best interest of the children? Yeah. I mean, I think it is. Again, I, I you know, want to stress that there's something you can pull out of here. Ignore the fact that they have money. Ignore the fact that they have fame and, you know, the ability to do things. And you can, and the law applies equally to both of them. Again, it's, to me, it's a complication. So let's go on and turn to Michael in South Carolina. You know, we've got Bruce Willis and Demi Moore. Some of you may have seen this. I found it a little bit odd, and I had to actually read the article because I thought, what is going on? You find that uh, Bruce Willis decided to shelter in place not with his spouse, but with his ex-spouse, Demi Moore, together with their children during the pandemic, which uh, it was a little odd. And I know they started asking about it. And I think that, you know, he, they kind of beat around the bush about why. But I think the takeaway for me, Michael, is I want to talk about a little bit of a different thing is that is really could it be used against you? You know, let's just say, you know, Bruce Willis's spouse decides I've had enough. He's not with me can that be used against him? But you know, again, as we've done with each panelist, tell us a little bit about the status of South Carolina courts, and then I want to answer that question. I'll ask it again. Sure, Scott. Thanks. Um, so in South Carolina, our courts are actually open. Um, we are filing new actions every day. Um, we, we are on a limited uh, in-person hearings until June the 14th by the uh, Supreme Court court order, but the ju judges are holding virtual hearings uh, if they're contested. But we also have alternative measures from the court which allow us to obtain uncontested divorces and approving agreements as well um, without even having to appear in court at all. And so we were able to move those cases forward um, in what we call a, a di divorce hearing packet and things of that nature and actually submit all those documents to the court and uh, allow the judge to review and, when, with, and sign it without having to appear. That's good. You know, it's good that at least some of them are available to file openly. And we've talked a little bit in some spots in, in the Californias where you can't even file, they don't have e-filing. That's giving guys some relief, especially in South Carolina. So Bruce Willis, I mean, obviously, to me, again, I think to many you would find it a little odd. You know, they have a good relationship, apparently, but it just is weird. I'll just say it. It's weird <laughs> to go shelter in place. But let's say you're a guy out there and you decide to shack up with your, your ex-spouse and you're remarried. Is that something that per perhaps could be used against you? Misconduct? A judge is not going to like it, I imagine, in South Carolina? Sure, Scott. So there are many risks associated with uh, living with an ex-spouse, especially if you're uh, currently going through a divorce or if your uh, current wife <laughs> decided she wanted to file. Um, this, at least in South Carolina, would open up a Pandora's box of problems. For instance, mm -hmm. your current spouse could, could allege di um, divorce based on adultery, um, you know, you know, it can open up the door to other negative impacts, uh, including uh, an increased likelihood of alimony as well, um, and expose you to, to that issue. And in some, um, some instances in South Carolina, 
you, know, you could even be ordered to pay some or all of your current uh, spouse's attorney's fees if uh, you know, it was proven for adultery. So it's probably a terrible idea. Yeah, I think, you know, we've always said, think before you speak, think before you act. You know, and what sounds like a great idea if your marriage is rocky probably isn't the best idea. So you need to think about it. And I think one of the, the things that, that jumped out to me as a potential negative was here, let's say Bruce gets, uh, it's a general guy. He's decided to, to move in with his ex-spouse and now they're sharing costs during the pandemic. But this guy's going to say, well, I can't afford because I've been laid off. I, I can't afford alimony or child support or I don't have the same kind of income. I think it raises issues. Now you're sharing expenses with your ex-spouse. And I imagine that's going to be introduced in court as evidence against you. Sure, Scott. So, um, you know, one of the first things um, that popped into my mind was that are there any outstanding orders regarding alimony obligations? Because that could have uh, a negative impact on either one of the parties as far as continued cohabitation with somebody else and uh, negating that alimony claim that one of you may have been receiving or paying. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to look at that. And then uh, as far as you know, sharing expenses, maybe somebody is going to claim they need more or less uh, child support or spousal support later on and, and try to modify. So there's just many, many different things that need to be considered. Yeah, I mean, there is a positive if you look at it, and I think we can always take a positive out of this. And that is something that guys should think about that they could do and they should do because I've seen it in my cases and you can comment, Michael. And that is, I've seen ex-spouses come in and testify against our client before saying, you know, he never communicated with me and we have children and he was never very good about reaching decisions. And obviously, you know, maybe we take this as a positive. You've got Bruce Willis and Demi Moore obviously communicating well uh, to kind of raise their, their maybe adult children uh, and, and doing it in a positive manner. So I imagine that could be just the opposite can be used in, in, as an advantage for your client. Sure. Um, I would think that it would, it would likely prove to the court that, you know, you're placing your needs uh, of the children before and over the, you know, your needs or desires at this time. Um, you're showing that you're willing to co-parent, you know, even post divorce. Obviously um, the ex uh, spouse does not have a problem with you if she's allowing you to live, you know, in, in the, in the home together. So uh, as far as in the best interest of the children or showing uh, best interest of your children with the current spouse as well, uh, it can all, all be a positive thing. Yeah. I mean, you can look at the Jennifer Gardner and Ben Affleck and, you know, that's an article on dad's divorce. You can check that out. That's a really good example of a positive and they've seemed to have a good relationship, albeit you got substance abuse issues perhaps in there. And we don't know the true story, but I think there's positives to take away from this Bruce Willis Demi Moore story. So thanks, Michael. So we want to get to uh, the lightning round next. And remember, if you want to ask your question live on the air, you can submit that at the Q&A section. If you want your question answered, just read, and we'll have it answered. You can submit that in the chat box. But do that now, and we're going to take a very, very quick break. We're going to come right back and start ans answering your questions. For some dads out there, the coronavirus pandemic has become a pretext to limit access to their children. Other dads have been pushed out of key decisions affecting their children's lives. If you're one of those dads, Cordell & Cordell is here for you, as always, but with expanded services. We can meet you in person or by video conference on weekdays, evenings, or weekends. Our goal is to step up our service to meet your needs now. Welcome back. So now it's time for the lightning round in our town hall where we can take your questions. We're going to have our panel answer those for you. We do have one live question that we want to bring to you now, and I'm going to turn that over to Michael. So let's go from Rich from Indiana. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm uh, living in Indiana, and I have three kids, and I pay monthly child support, and I pay it on time. Uh, I was recently laid off uh, from my employer, so of course my income has been decreased. Uh, I'm paying what I can, and it, but it's tight at the moment. My ex-wife says she wants to modify so that I have to pay even more. And I know for a fact she's using money for other things than childcare. So what should I do in this instance? Well, thanks, Rich. Michael, you know, the, in the common situation here he is, uh, you know, a part of the, the pandemic and being laid off and obviously has an issue paying child support and can't afford it. And, and no one can blame him, but spouses may be taking advantage of a bad situation. What is it Rich can do 
faced with a layoff, paying child support while I can right now, obviously may wind up running out of money and funds and trying to meet all of his expenses. What's available to him? Sure. Uh, thanks for your question, Rich. Um, of course, this is you know coming up all the time now. And uh, unfortunately, child support, at least in South Carolina, it does not stop until you have a new court order um, or have entered you know, an agreement in writing with the spouse. So at this point in time, we would you know suggest that you continue to pay what you can, like what you said, but I would immediately go ahead and file for a modification of child support based upon uh, your change uh, in, in, in employment. Um, like you said, you're already doing the right things. It sounded like you're continuing to pay uh, what you can. But again, I mean, if you're, you know, have no or limited income or if it's been decreased, I don't think that uh, your um, spouse or ex-spouse would be um, able to have it increased at this point in time. I don't, I don't think that would fly very well with the judges. Yeah, and I think just to, to kind of close the loop, Rich, one of the things you want to do is get an attorney on the line. Let's take a look at your decree. Let's see what the incomes were at the time of the divorce. Let's look at what your last income was before you received a reduction. We want to make sure that there isn't an ability to get an increase, even with a you know a temporary reduction or a layoff. But obviously, retroactivity on your child support's key. We want to start that line of demarcation where we can give you the best chance to get the full relief possible. So you need to seek the assistance of an attorney. Obviously, we've got attorneys in Indianapolis and in Indiana that can and consult with you. That's the best starting place right now is invest an hour, get that decree. Let's figure out what, uh, how we can help you and point you in the right direction. So let's go to uh, Steve from Illinois. We're going to turn this over to Colleen in Texas, but Steve in Illinois. Uh, hey guys, I'm an essential worker uh, who lives in Illinois. Um, and I go to an office every day with 10 people or less at a time. Uh, my ex-spouse is a nurse, and she wants me to take our kids full-time so that they're not around her and potentially exposed to the virus. Uh, but I'm unable to do this because I have to be at work part-time, and the kids can't be home alone. So is there anything I can do, and should she have to compensate me if I do have to take them full-time and take some time off work? Well, thanks. So, Colleen, let me tell you real quickly, it's kind of a complicated because there's some issues about when does child support stop? When can he get reimbursement? It's kind of a, a temporary, so I'll let you take it from there. Absolutely. So uh, I guess first and foremost, look at your order, right? And then contact an attorney in Illinois to determine whether you guys, by filing a modification right now, you could very much reach an agreed temporary order that can make that change. Very much with the idea that this is a a pandemic situation and, and and this is going to be a short-term fix where everyone's changing the possession schedule a little bit and we're changing finances a little bit so I would see if you could get something in writing specifically with an open case for temporary orders I think that that would be the best way to proceed if you just do something informally I, I would be a little leery of that. Please talk to an attorney, but make sure everything is in writing, whether it's text message, email, our family wizard, you just have to make sure it's in writing so that just in case she's having a bad day, comes back, changes her mind, it's not that you took the kids against this order. Thanks. So I'm going to go to some chat submitted questions. Eager, so I'm going to th throw one to you from Chris. Uh, Chris says, my business has been negatively affected and my income due to COVID-19 as a result. Uh, Chris is paying alimony. He wants to know if he can pay a lesser amount of alimony to his ex-spouse until the business and income improves. And if so, how does he proceed? And how does he let the spouse know, you know he needs to pay less? And so it's kind of a multifaceted question about alimony uh, when a temporary reduction in pay. Uh, thank you, Scott. And Scott, can you, can you repeat what state is Chris from? I had an interruption on my... Yeah, I don't have the state uh, for Chris, uh, so let's just assume it's Missouri, just as oh. an example, and be general. Okay, so if it's in Missouri, it, first you have to look at the judgment of the solution to find out whether that alimony or maintenance is modifiable or non-modifiable. If it's not modifiable, it's a contractual maintenance, unfortunately, there is nothing you can do about it as far as uh, modifying it to decrease it because of your increase on income. If it's modifiable, however, decrease in income because you lost your job because of the pandemic, uh, you know, you're affected, then that's considered a significant and substantial change of circumstance. First advice is you have to file something immediately if you're in Missouri. That's the way you put the court of notice about this change of circumstance of yours. In Missouri, if you wait and if you don't, let's say you want to file three months later, the court cannot go back retroactively three months uh, before. The court only can start from the date of filing. 
So if your order is in Missouri and it's a modifiable maintenance and you are affected by the virus and you've lost your income or have had a, re a reduction in income like Chris, then again, a motion to modify the maintenance uh, should be filed immediately and seek that with the court. Yeah. I agree. I mean, the only thing is one, get a consultation with an attorney, retroactivity uh, activity and, and kind of establishing that line is so important. But, you know, communicating with your ex-spouse saying, hey, as you know, I'm unemployed. Or if she doesn't know, say, I just, you know, have a decrease in pay. My business doesn't have anything coming in. We're closed because of shelter in place. You know, any even oral agreements are, are problematic. You know, you're going to get something in writing that could be a defense, but you really can't modify it unless a judge signs off on it. So I think what's important is to establish it by filing a motion. That way, at least you're taking advantage of your rights and asserting that you can't pay, and at least you're paying something moving forward. So let me keep going on. Uh, there's a question that came in uh, from the chat. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Diana. Uh, the question is, uh, with interest rates so low, what should I know about considering refinancing my home before my divorce is finalized? The deed and mortgage have always only been in my name and both acquired before marriage. So I know I have a, a comment, Diana, about that, but I'll let you take it over. It's from Daniel in Kentucky. Hi, Daniel. So even if the deed and the mortgage were premarital, there's going to be a question if it's still marital property. So if there was any renovations done to the house or if there were marital assets, which is money, put into the house, it could still be partially considered a marital asset. Now, if it is a marital asset, you obviously need the permission of your ex-spouse. But if you've already done it or you're going to decide to do it without them, the courts will take that into consideration and it's going to depend on when you sell the house. So if a divorce is already filed, it's going to be appraised as of the date of the filing anyway. If you are going to, a lot of people now are not trying or are doing the forbearance because of COVID, the court is going to consider their circumstances at the time. But obviously, if it's a property that's yours, it's premarital and your spouse has no interest to it, you are free to do that. Yeah. And, and Scott, may I jump in real quick? Yeah, please. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to add that when you file for a divorce, your assets and debts, irrespective of the later determination of being marital or no marital, they are under the court's microscope subject to a claim by the other party, subject to court's divisions. That's why oftentimes, even on the judgment of dissolution, you do include no marital property as being part of that judgment. With that said, it's always best, I would say, to first discuss that with the other party uh, and see if you can reach an agreement, even if you believe that the property is no marital property, just to avoid any issues. Uh, in case if the other party makes a claim that part of that property is marital, which it's only going to be the court that's going to determine that at the end of the day. Yeah. So to, to avoid any issues, just see if you can reach an agreement, which, you know, most likely benefits both you and, and your spouse uh, in the long run. And I think as enticing, just to kind of round that question up, is as enticing as the lower interest rates are, I think one of the considerations is what kind of free cash flow are you providing that may be used against you in child support and alimony or even attorney's fees. You know, you don't want to walk into a court uh, or a trial where you've now uh, lowered your expenses and provided more free cash flow, what we call net available income, right? What is your expenses? What is your income? And what's the difference? We want that to be zero or negative. Most guys are living paycheck to paycheck and they're charging everything and they're running up credit card balances. That's a position where you kind of want to be in, in some respects, it's in, 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 although be it financially bad, it's good from a family law perspective because you don't have a lot of free cash flow. A lot of states look at your ability to meet your own expenses first before they analyze spousal support. A lot of states differ, but that's something really to consider uh, whether or not it's a good move financially to lower your expense burden until this is resolved. And maybe you lock in the rate and you don't refinance until then. Something really, again, like everything we talked about today, seek the counsel of an attorney. That's really important. So let me turn it over to Alex and go to a question. Alex. Uh, this is, what if my spouse or my child's uh, ex-spouse or whatever does not want to help with the child with distance learning? So the question is, is, what if a father does not want to help with the distance learning? Since our divorce decree says that we are jointly responsible, uh, are they required to help? And, they, and generally, you know, we look at legal custody and joint decision making on health and educational welfare. Alex, the question really becomes is, can it be used against you if they don't both participate equally in distance learning? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's really sort of flying in the face of what joint legal custody really speaks to. Um, you know, you, you are joint legal custodians of those, of those minor children, and so you really need to take, um, you know, these, these decisions with regards to education or welfare very seriously. So if you are refusing to participate um, in something as important as the, you know, educational decisions here, it isn't going to reflect well if, if those issues make it to court. Um, you know, so definitely I, I agree with that. I think that it's not going to reflect well, um, you know, in that. And, and it's definitely something that, you know, you should open up the line of communication and start trying to talk to them about it. Yeah. So Ron, here's a question from Maryland. Uh, and it is, my divorce is final. I keep hearing from the kids who are quite young and seeing evidence of what I think is child abuse. For instance, one of them was missing teeth and said mom took the teeth out and it was painful. Maybe I'm seriously concerned, but I'm not a dentist and would let the teeth come out on their own. But there's other stuff like putting hot pepper in their mouth as punishment for leaving the room in the middle of the night and coming to hers. Do I have any recourse, Ron, um, you know, in terms of what can they do and what should they do? Sure. So it's not something that I know about your obligation to report in Maryland. I'm very sorry to hear that your kids are going through that situation. In most states, to my understanding, you're going to be a mandated reporter. If you have a good faith reason to believe that there is abuse going on, then you should report it immediately to the Child Protective Services, whatever that may be called in Maryland, and let them screen it out. You're not the person to make the call, right? Because you don't know what constitutes necessarily abuse. It's something that concerns you. It sounds like you're rightfully concerned. Call the people who are the experts about what is abuse and what isn't. Give them a chance to consider whether to investigate further and then let them take action on that. Once you do contact uh, social services, then if you are concerned, I will consult with an attorney and see if you have sufficient grounds to file a motion or an application in your state for emergency custody. Again, lay out the grounds, provide the necessary documentation, and provide it to the court to let them determine. Uh, don't engage in self-help, I would say. For It's usually not a great idea. Turn to the professionals, follow the rules, and then that will give you the best chance to help your kids. Yep. Great. Thanks, Ron. You know, Alex, I want to come to you. I know you wanted to update a little bit about Connecticut court system. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention um, that I didn't mention earlier was that the, the governor did um, put out an executive order recently. Um, we're still working out all the details, but I know uh, myself and a couple of other people in Connecticut have cases that are still pending. We were close to reaching an agreement, uh, and then the courts closed. They've recently opened up ways for us to process those divorce, similar to what Michael was saying, on the paper, so to speak. So, you know, we have people filing affidavits and all of the necessary documents. So there is movement, there is business being done. But again, you know, as I mentioned before, there are still some things that are closed, but, but we can still process things through and, and, and get people moving here. So. Good. All right, I'll stay with you, Alex. I've got Marty has a question. Um, I have a co-parent that refuses to communicate. My children, 8, 10, and 14, a court-appointed therapist has reported child abuse twice. Uh, mom refuses to use the court-appointed tool, co-parenter, and is not registered. The kids continue to report neglect and abuse. Her parents are the primary caretakers and will not allow the kids to call me uh, and are also the abusers and continue to make negative comments of parental alienation. Uh, really, what can Marty do here you know, with all these facts. You know, uh, what's jumping out at me immediately is this is seeming to me to be one of those priority one cases where this is really an emergency custody situation and you've got to get, um, you know, speak to an attorney in your state, uh, find out, you know, what you need to do and what sort of information you need to present to the court and get that motion filed. Um, even if the courts are closed uh, physically in some places, they are hearing those ex parte emergency uh, cases. And, you know, based on what you've written here, it's certainly something that, you know, I would, I would try to do immediately. Yeah. Diana, kind of the last question we have submitted from Carrie before our time runs out. Uh, and Carrie's kind of got a long situation. I'm not going to read it all because it's so lengthy, but really has some, had some problems with a divorce judge and the way they perceived how things went. Uh, it appears that... Uh, uh, the judge went outside the law from Carrie's perspective and ordered uh, to pay over 90% of gross income working a temporary job, setting Carrie up for failure. Uh, Carrie has an attorney, uh, filed a motion to amend, uh, to alter or vacate. The judge denied it. And now Carrie's filed an appeal while waiting for the appeal. Now there's a contempt filed uh, who is asking for Carrie to go to jail, obviously. 
Um, I've not worked because of COVID. Um, and I could never afford the order that does now follow Alabama law. And so I guess the question I think we should answer really, Diana, is on this contempt, is there something they can do to kind of slow the contempt down to stay the contempt order while there's an appeal? So there should have been an interlocutory appeal pending, which means basically you don't have to follow the court order or it should be stayed. I'm sorry, it should be stayed while the appeal is happening. But at this point, if there is a change in circumstance from the time the first order was entered, she can probably just file a new motion since the appeal is going to take a very long time. Try to file a new motion based on a substantial change in circumstance at this point is probably her best option. Yeah, I agree. I mean, taking some action, just not letting the, the, the motion for contempt lie. So uh, that's all we have the time for today. So thank you for joining us. Remember to visit us at CordellCordell.com or call us at 866-DADS-LAW so you can get in contact with a Cordell attorney near you around the country and also in the UK. Also tune into our daily podcast where we'll spend 15 to 20 minutes talking about particular issues that interest you, that affect you because of COVID-19. We continue to answer questions at coronavirus.divorce at cordelllaw.com. So we're going to continue to bring you this virtual town hall each Thursday in addition to our daily podcasts. So continue to tune in. Remember this live webinar was presented to you by Lexicon, who's a legal technology and service company. So thank you to them. Until next time.